Thank you, and I want to welcome everybody uh, on behalf of David. Uh, this is Scott. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon to talk about um, this important topic. School improvement planning, whether we're talking about school-wide improvement efforts or through collaborative team activities at a grade level or a department or a subject area, are instrumental to school and school system efforts to meet the needs of all learners. It's been our experience, though, and this has been confirmed in research, that often teams and individual decision makers skip a very important part of the decision process that results in efforts being a lot less consequential than we'd all hope. Perhaps worse, the problems you were trying to treat in the first place continue to persist. So if you look on your screen, our objectives for this afternoon is to first discuss school improvement in the context of action research, so our position that all school improvement efforts are, in fact, action research um, projects. Um, we want to explore how and why root cause analysis, or RCA, is important to the success of your school improvement efforts. And before we conclude today, um, we'll give you a series of steps and provide some tools, some formats you can use in order to conduct root cause analysis. Next slide, please. To get us warmed up, and this would be an ideal time for you to type in a suggestion, I'm going to turn this over in a moment to the amazing Dr. Brazer. Um, Dr. Brazer uh, would like you to consider a persistent problem in your school, some improvement area that you've been facing uh, or you contemplate uh, facing into the future. Um, and for any and all problems, the amazing Dr. Brazer will identify a solution that's absolutely guaranteed to work. I'll pause for about 15 seconds and let you type in a problem you're facing. Sure, well, I have one to start us off. Um, a principal of a rural elementary school poses a problem uh, that to a high a percentage of third graders are not reading at grade level. Dr. Brazer. Well, one of the reasons that students are unable to read at grade level is because some of their uh, reading skills have not been fully developed in previous grades. And so typically they need some additional time uh, in order to work on those skills and build them up so that they can actually become fluent readers. What I recommend under those conditions is that uh, we involve the third graders in an after-school tutorial program that meets their specific needs um, that will help them in their reading comprehension. I have another one here. Uh, could you talk a little bit about transiency and attendance as problems? Yes, of course. Transiency is a, a big issue, in, particularly in a number of urban settings or schools that are located near military bases. And what we often find is that uh, students who've moved schools uh, frequently have difficulty with their school achievement because there are gaps in their learning. And so I think under those circumstances, the best way to work with such students is to involve them in after-school tutorial programs that help to make up those gaps that they may have in either reading or math or some other subject. Maria has uh, identified the problem of uh, gap closure between economically disadvantaged students. Yes, well, one of the issues with economically disadvantaged students is that they don't have resources at home that help them to succeed at the same level in school as some of the other students that, who may be there. Um, one of the most often cited um, missing resources is books in the home. And so I think if the school can provide books, uh, particularly in an after-school tutorial program kind of setting, then children, for example, would have the opportunity to improve their reading skills even though they come from economically disadvantaged families. Um, at this point, Dr. Brazer has solved all of your problems with an after-school tutorial program. You're probably, at least we hope, chuckling a little bit, or maybe you're grimacing a little. This sounds a little bit too familiar. Um, but uh, the point we're trying to make here um, is that very often, uh, we have ready-made solutions for all sorts of problems, and it's our point that uh, what's happening is we're missing um, a step in the school improvement planning process by jumping to solutions. That becomes the focus of our talk today. Next slide, please, David. I think I'm glad that no one can see me because I'm blushing incredibly. Um, I, I just wanted to say that we appreciate the serious questions from the audience. But our, our tongue-in-cheek dialogue that we just engaged in is all too familiar to many of us. When faced with a problem or a dilemma, we're under a lot of pressure to act and to act quickly to adopt a solution or a best practice to help remedy the problem. 
This reveals one of the biggest reasons why such efforts fail. Consider the number of times you have felt obligated or were mandated to adopt a new program. Or the number of times your school improvement planning team started a conversation with discussion of an action that you ought to implement because it happens to be someone's favorite idea, like an after-school tutorial program. Or you heard teachers asking, why do we have to do this? Or what happened to the program we started using last year? We think of these kinds of situations as an indication that the solutions are actually searching for problems rather than the other way around. One of the most important steps in any improvement process is identifying the root causes or performance gaps. Why aren't students performing at the levels that we seek? Problems persist when we jump to the first obvious solution. Or worse, we may actually create new problems by adopting solutions without taking the time to fully diagnose the causes. We get failure because our solutions treat the symptoms of the problems, the surface level or visible manifestations. Favored solutions don't always connect to the underlying reasons the problems exist in the first place. Strategies labeled best practices may be worthwhile approaches to school improvement. But no best practice can, best, can be best for all schools, for all children, under all conditions, at all times. The work you do is far too complex for any predetermined magic elixir to work every time. We started by calling root cause analysis the missing link in school improvement planning. Root causes, as we, term, as we term them, are reasons problems exist in the first place. Symptoms are the visible manifestations of the problem. Understanding causes will allow you to target the genesis of the problem. Reducing or eliminating a problem requires identifying and reducing its causes. An analogy is helpful here. If we go to the doctor with a congested chest and a cough, we're presenting pro with symptoms of an underlying problem. Any physician worth her salt, any doctor you'd be likely to continue wanting to see, would run some tests and examine you to understand the causes of these symptoms before prescribing a course of action. The symptoms might be an indicator of something quite simple, like the common cold. Or they could be symptomatic of something much, much worse. Note also the doctor will try to collect as much information as possible about the symptoms depending on their nature before deciding on a course of action. In your school, root cause analysis is essential to organizational learning. In much the same way as the doctor needs to learn about your symptoms and build a knowledge base about um, the underlying issues before understanding steps you can take to get well, root cause analysis helps you and your team build a deep understanding of what's going on that contributes to the problem that you're trying to, tr to treat. Next slide, please. We know you're probably thinking, this has got to take a lot of time, and it can become very, very complicated. We'd argue that while this is true, these are not, in fact, the most compelling reasons to jump to the first solution. First, while root cause analysis is an extra step in planning, it generally results in a much more effective solution that does a much better job of producing lasting gains. In terms of the complexity of root cause analysis, we have to admit that many problems that are faced in your schools are, in fact, very complex. We're in a complicated business. But we'd like to suggest that a step-by-step -step approach to root cause analysis can be vital and actually save you time in the sense that it can make all facets of your planning and problem solving more effective. To use an overused cliche, this is about working smarter, not harder. A point we'd like to make before continuing on to the steps of root cause analysis is that we see root cause analysis as a part of a cycle. And we look at this school improvement cycle as being akin to conducting action research. It all starts with collaborative problem diagnosis. What are the problems you have in the first place? You would find those from examining symptoms. Next step in the cycle is, is root cause analysis, um, which proceeds to solution development and then reflection on evaluation and back to the beginning. 
the cycle involves a systematic analysis of what you're doing at, as a school, identifying ways to address your goals, and over time evaluating how well your actions meet your improvement objectives. Next slide, please. The initial step, which was depicted in the upper left portion of the previous slide, the initial step in any action research process is problem diagnosis. Change theorists remind us that the need for change is defined by a gap between the real, that is what's going on now in your school, and the ideal, where it is that you want to be. Gaps occur because performance isn't meeting expectations, or possibly because expectations have changed. The ideal has elevated, expanded, or shifted. Symptoms represent the visible surface level warning signs that a problem may exist. Test scores are an example of symptoms. They help you to identify a gap between the real and the ideal. But test scores cannot tell you why the gap exists. If you only treat the symptoms, you will not eliminate the gap. Only by reducing or eliminating causes can we reduce the gaps between what's happening right now and where we'd like to see our students achieving. I'm going to pose an example and pause for a few moments for your input. Suppose you're the principal of an elementary school with 560 students in grades K through 5. You've just received results from the state's mandated end of course test showing that 35 percent of your third graders are not reading on grade level. What are some possible causes? Maybe ELL students uh, are to blame. This particular group is cognitive less uh, capable than the previous year's class. And then okay. uh, demographics, ELL, special ed populations, or curriculum alignment. Another one is what's being taught doesn't meet what's measured on the test. The quality of instruction. Okay. You guys are doing very well. <laughs> Student fluency, attendance, the quality of the assessment by the principal or, or the teachers, the study of the student's needs isn't correct, limited teacher capacity, teacher left and went on leave. And we'll share with you some of the causes that we thought of, um, and they duplicate some that you phoned in. Um, some possible causes of um, the problem um, that 35% of our third graders aren't reading on grade level. Um, could include uh, poor vocabulary skills, um, inadequate access to vision care, um, poor reading instruction, something that, that you all mentioned. Uh, perhaps the reading material available in class or at home is just boring or uninteresting. Um, and of course, um, uh, students may have undiagnosed learning disabilities. The point here is um, if, for example, we followed the advice of the amazing Dr. Brazer, instead of generating some ideas about causes, um, we would have invested time and energy in establishing an after-school tutorial program to try and improve third graders' reading achievement. How likely might that have been um, to address any of the causes you thought of or the ones that we suggested here? Um, if your team adopts the first obvious solution, you might have adopted one that treats an important cause, or perhaps not. Next slide, please. We encourage you to think through the nature of causes and their relation to underlying problems and symptoms. A few points are worth mentioning. First, most problems you are likely to care about have many causes, and not all of them are equally important. Second, your school has control of only some of these causes. Focusing on causes that you cannot control will create frustration not change. Third, when you think about causes, it's important to re remember that a lack of something is a solution in disguise as a cause. It is not a cause itself. If I say that we lack time for something, I have committed to the solution of providing more time. This might in fact be an issue, but you are likely to close yourself off to fuller investigation by taking this approach. And besides, why do you lack time? This may be a far more important question to answer. How do you learn about causes? You learn about causes from a combination of sources. The craft knowledge of stakeholders in your school is important. What we mean by craft knowledge is the knowledge that teachers in your school, teachers and others uh, in your school, carry around in their heads but don't necessarily talk about unless asked. In an age of evidence-based practice, we often forget that the folks in our school are sources of evidence. Ignoring this source is a big mistake. 
Number two, experiences of schools like yours in your region might help you learn about the nature of persistent problems. Networking is helpful. And number three, published research can inform you about experiences of schools like yours. It is very helpful to access the knowledge base and mine what is known regarding causes. Earlier we, pr we promised you a step-by-step -step approach um, to root cause analysis, and we'd like to start going through these steps one at a time. And we have some forms and suggestions for how you can go about conducting each step in the analysis. First, you'll clearly define the performance gap or the problem. That's, you know, that comes from examining the evidence you have available, uh, testing scores, craft knowledge, etc. You would plan your inquiry in your school into possible causes by identifying stakeholders who have knowledge that would be valuable to you and means you would have to approach them. Uh, you would consult the literature as feasible to find out what is known about common causes to problems like yours in schools like yours. You would record possible solutions, identify those you have control over, and then we recommend that you rank order the causes that you have influence over um, to get an, an approximation of which are the most important and which might provide you the greatest leverage in order to move forward to solutions. Here we have a worksheet that can help you plan your inquiry. You'll notice at the top that we've stated the problem, and it's very important to get a statement that you and others you might be working with can agree upon. So we've said that results from the state's mandated end of course tests, test show that 35% of third graders are not reading on grade level. Let's work on building that deeper understanding of the problem that we introduced earlier. We've clearly defined the problem. And as a team, we have begun to identify stakeholders who have direct knowledge that may be helpful to us in identifying causes. We've listed here the third grade teachers, obviously because they're the ones who are teaching the students. But we also believe that parents of third graders may have information that would be helpful to us. And possibly in your school, there are reading specialists who work with students in small groups or on a one-on-one -on -one basis who see the, the problem that's manifested through the test scores on a daily basis and have um, perhaps a, a different perspective from the classroom teachers. Note that collecting evidence from stakeholders doesn't always have to be conducting a large-scale survey, which takes a lot of time and other resources. Simplify. You can simply talk to the third grade teachers or the reading specialists to learn their perspectives. If each member of a leadership team contacts two to three parents, as another example, you may have feedback from a few dozen sources in a very short period of time. Record causes you identify from the various sources that you used on the previous slide and share them as a team to build up your evidence. Your hypothesis helps spell out what we will describe later as a logic of action, the reasons why you believe a cause is a cause. Again, this is important to helping you understand both how important a cause might be and ultimately how you might approach a solution. So if we look at the top example for now, access to vision care, our hypothesis is that impaired vision makes it difficult to read. Sounds like a reasonable logic of action. Evidence to support the claim is that students complain, or we learn from our discussions with parents, that their children have difficulty seeing, seeing what they're reading. You can also make note on this form of causes you have control over and those you really don't have control over. Focus on the causes you can control so that you have optimal impact. A next step that we find particularly helpful is to rank order or estimate the strength or importance of each cause. There's nothing scientific about this. This is simply based on what you know at your site from the evidence that you've gathered. But doing this will help you get closer to an understanding about how to move forward. If you look at the table, it makes sense that you would make your first effort to address the needs that are identified with the heaviest weights, which would be poor reading instruction and weak vocabulary skills. We encourage you to get, engage others in your school in this type of analysis as a way of helping everyone to come to a, <clears throat> as a way of helping everyone to come to a common understanding 
about how best to address the problem you have identified. There are some additional tools available to conduct the kind of analysis we're talking about. We list three of them on this slide, and we can talk about them very briefly. Each one um, is a useful group process technique. Uh, our assumption is that you're going to be primarily doing your planning in groups, or um, you'll be working with grade level teams or um, smaller groups in your school uh, to identify root causes. An affinity diagram may be familiar to you. It's a grouping process um, technique that allows you to mine stakeholder knowledge. So for example, um, if you started with the problem of 35% of third graders not reading at grade level, um, you might um, give to each member of the team five index cards and ask them to write a possible cause on each index card. If you have 10 people on your team, you now have um, a database of 50 possible causes. You can read through those, sort them, group them, and in that, that way generate some ideas through um, structured brainstorming of the kinds of causes that uh, all 10 people might feel are at play. A fishbone diagram is a graphic organizer. If you picture um, a, a stick diagram of a fish, the spine would, rec would represent the problem you're working on, and fins coming off of the spine um, would be arrayed as possible um, causes. And you could have um, subtopics that help you build knowledge about why those causes exist and what those may be. And using this kind of graphic organizer, um, you are connecting each one of your causes and an understanding of those causes to your problem. Uh, the last technique, um, which dates back uh, into the 1950s and total quality management, um, is the five whys. Um, for any problem, start by asking why. Why are 35% of our third graders not reading at grade level? And the technique here is to start the group with the first why, generate some conversation, and then five successive times continue asking why. What this allows you to do is drill down and refine your conversation um, to really try and pinpoint um, in, in a fine fashion um, what's going on and what you all believe. Uh, very simple technique uh, can be done in any group setting uh, with as, as few as a couple of people um, or as many as a, as a fairly large group. Um, it's been used for decades, um, as I said, in total quality circles. Um, and it's particularly useful at the beginning stages of root cause analysis. Finally, there's a last step when you've identified the root causes that you can control and you're starting to transition into identifying solutions. It's important to spell out your logic of action. What we're talking about is being explicit about what you're trying to achieve, how you plan to achieve it, and why you believe this is an effective approach. This is a check on your hypotheses, or hypotheses or your hunches be sure that the solution will, in fact, help eliminate the causes you identified. So we work this through with the prompts that are on the slide. This year, we will try to improve the reading achievement of third grade students by, and there you would insert the solution or action that you and your group have identified as being the most likely to eliminate causes, because, and here's where you put in the causes that you believe you will eliminate or at least reduce. You're answering the question, how will taking this action eliminate the causes? And finally, what we expect to accomplish is, and that's where you identify the observable or measurable outcomes that you're seeking through your solution set. We've run through the entire presentation. And just to reiterate, um, we've discussed school improvement as an action research process a continuous cycle of learning that you engage in uh, with teams in your school. We've identified root cause analysis as a vitally important part of your planning efforts, one that um, we found and research has confirmed that many groups skip over in favor of jumping to a solution. We've provided some ideas about tools you can use um, to conduct root cause analysis and thus build the logic of action that connects the symptoms you identified um, to causes and then to solutions, so that when you implement those solutions, you're actually eliminating the problem by eliminating its causes.
we'd be happy to take any questions you have um, about the process. And what you see on the screen is a picture of and um, a citation for um, our book, which includes root cause analysis as a fundamental step in planning. Okay. Well, um, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, write it in. We'll be happy to get back to you on that. Or I would really encourage you to stay tuned to our next three uh, webinars on school improvement. Uh, where Dr. Bauer and Dr. Brazier will be uh, coming back on different topics in school improvement to help us out. The dates for those webinars have been set for August 14th, August 28th, and September 11th. So please stay tuned. We'll send you some information on it. Uh, keep, uh, feel free to register for it. And Oh, I do, I do have one question here. Wait a minute before we go. Do you suggest doing this as a school-wide process or with small groups or committees? That's a great question. Um, I think you'll have uh, a more profitable experience um, doing this kind of process in small groups or, or committees. And I think the key, and, and I'm sure David will comment on this, um, is to purposefully construct those committees with um, individuals who have knowledge that can be applied um, to the analysis you're doing. Um, but also, um, any small group that can lead a root cause analysis um, using some of the techniques that we talked about um, can in turn involve many more people, for example, in uh, conducting an affinity diagram activity um, with uh, one or more groups around the school or conducting a focus group conversation about causes. I think in addition to that, another way to approach this is in steps. So if you're working on trying to move the, the school ahead in some particular area or a portion of it, um, you may start in a smaller group, as Scott suggests, and present the results of the root cause analysis and the effort to uh, clearly identify the problem. Present that to the larger group and ask for input um, on the ideas that are presented to help refine the work of the smaller group. What that does also, and I might mention, is that it, it helps people from around the school understand what this smaller group is working on rather than getting surprised when there's a fully developed solution and action plan uh, for a problem they hadn't heard about before. Uh, with that, I will uh, let everyone go. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bauer, Dr. Brazer. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. And we will look forward to uh, talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.